Welcome to Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, Chapter 12, Excel Spreadsheets. Um, this is going to sound very silly because I know that most of you have ran into Excel spreadsheets in one form or another, but who here uses Excel spreadsheets at least once a week? Okay. Who here has seen entire business processes implemented through filling out the right boxes in Excel spreadsheets? Now you can write software that will hopefully accelerate that solution of business processes in Excel spreadsheets through opening up Excel spreadsheets using your Python in order to modify or update them or verify them or process them. And, uh, you know, someday maybe you'll move on to something slightly more sophisticated than an Excel spreadsheet as a data storage format. But it does have a lot of conveniences. Um, people are pretty used to attaching them onto emails and emailing them around. Uh, most people know how to write an Excel macro or two. And it keeps a lot of people employed because I think the last time that um, they did a uh, uh, Society of Computational Machinery research article on it, the average Excel spreadsheet has about 2.8 bugs in it. So, working with Excel spreadsheets, it's a powerful a spreadsheet application for Windows, and what we will be using in order to open our Excel spreadsheets today is the OpenPy Excel module. And uh, it's conveniently named OpenPy Excel uh, in order to get all of those phonetic Excels in there. So uh, occasionally when you're opening up an Excel spreadsheet, uh, you're going to do various things by hand. If you start noticing yourself following patterns of doing particular things, or if you need to have some software that would do it perhaps with better accuracy than you would do it over and over again by hand, it might be worthwhile to actually write a Python module that will pop this spreadsheet open and uh, perform the operations needed. So, uh, for those of you who know, there are Excel spreadsheets that predate the XLSX extension. We're only going to cover the XLSX spreadsheets. They are actually an internal XML file format that uh, Excel uses. And uh, we need to go over some basic terminology for those of you who have used spreadsheets but perhaps haven't thought about the components of a spreadsheet recently. The overall spreadsheet, everything that's in it, is referred to as a workbook. Now within that workbook, if you're using Excel, you'll see little tabs at the bottom. And the tabs will change out the grids of cells. These tabs correspond to sheets. And each one of those grids of cells is its own sheet. Now within inside those cells, you have rows and columns. And the uh, rows and columns are referenced by number and by letter. OK? Uh, they did that originally in order to try to keep people from mistakenly reversing the rows and columns. Uh, but because you know it's so fun to uh, refer to things by their letter, uh, generally speaking, you wind up having lots of issues with what happens when you go over 26 letters. Well, you start off with AA, and then AB, and so on, until you hit AZ, and then you hit BA, and it just keeps going. And uh, because of this slightly unusual uh, letter numbering scheme, one of the very useful things to do with uh, the open uh, Pi Excel module is to use its conversion routines so you can actually reference these things by numerical index. So here is uh, the run through that they've talked about, about the Excel spreadsheets. And here you can see that this is a default spreadsheet in Excel. Now, I don't have Excel on this laptop uh, because it's Linux. But the point is, is they're going through and they're talking about the columns, A, B, and C, and the rows. And uh, we do have this uh, file here. 
And so this is the same spreadsheet. This happens to look a little bit differently because it's opened inside LibreOffice. And here at the bottom, it's small, but you can see the sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. And if you can't, uh, just trust me, it's that. So now that we've got this spreadsheet, let's open it up and let's take a look at what it, what's uh, there. So, so of course this is Python, Python three. So what we're going to need to do is first we'll need to import the module. Okay. Now that this module is imported, we would like to store the workbook into a variable called wb. And we will do uh, open pi Excel load workbook. We've got to give it the name of the file that you're opening up. Uh, now, it just happens to be that this file is in the same working directory as this Python interpreter. But if you've got a file in a different working directory, you're going to have to make path adjustments as necessary. And just so we can see what this module looks like real quick, we're going to go ahead and uh, just use the REPL eval inside to print it out. And you can see that what we have here is a OpenPyXL workbook, workbook, workbook object. <laughs> um, this is a side effect of Python's packaging for distribution. Okay, this is the namespace, this is the class, and then this is the actual object name. And so what you wind up with is uh, we've got this object right there that's been loaded in. Now this object actually represents the workbook that is inside the Excel file right here. So if we uh, go ahead and move along, one of the first things that we might want to do is to kind of get an idea of what's inside this workbook. And since the workbooks consist of sheets, let's do a dump of the sheets. Okay, so to get the sheets, you can do workbook and then you can get the sheet names. And here you can see that it prints out sheet one, sheet two, and sheet three. Now there is an active sheet, okay, and it is the last sheet that's on top. So if you opened it up, moved sheet two, like focused on that, and then saved it off, when you open it up again, then that sheet two will be the first sheet presented, regardless of the order in which they were created or the order in which they sort out by name. So in order to get the uh, active sheet, you can do get active sheet, and you can see that the active sheet is sheet one. And we can save this active sheet off to another sheet, and then you know, when you open it up inside Excel or something, a different sheet will present itself to the client. So once you get this uh, sheet, you'll notice that uh, if we capture it into a variable, so let's, let's get that active sheet again, but this time we'll capture it into a sheet. And uh, apparently the uh, text is old and the API has updated, so we've got a deprecation warning saying that we're using get active sheet when really we should be using the active property. We'll skip over that because otherwise we'd have to rewrite a lot of the material as we present. But if we want to see what kind of a sheet this is, uh, it says that it is a worksheet and its name is sheet. Okay. Now, this sheet object has uh, various items on it, and so if we were to pull out the title of this sheet, this is a sheet one title, and if we were to update this title, and then uh, take the workbook and save it back, and I'm just going to save it to a different name in order to uh, show you that, uh, you know, just basically in case we need the, the old workbook, I'm, I'm not gonna lose it. And then if we go back over here and we open it up, you can see that 
down here I've actually renamed the sheet its title. It's and it has Edwin instead of uh, sheep. So the main concept is, is that Python is wrapping this workbook inside an object. The object represents the workbook. And the workbook has objects within it that represent the sheets. And so this is how you can create new sheets inside workbooks. This is how you can rename and modify sheets inside the workbooks. Well, the sheets are only useful for holding the grids of fields that have the data in them. So occasionally, it'd be nice to be able to pull the sheet out by its name. And so if you grab the sheet by its name, you might say get the sheet that has some particular piece of information in it that you know you need to process. And uh, you know that might be specific to your business case. So one thing you can do is you can fetch this sheet by name. And if we go back, and uh, we'll do, um, we'll just reload the workbook. And since we uh, reloaded it, it's going to have the old naming that we had because I saved it to a different file. And now if we take a look at uh, sheet one, we look at its title, it's, it's sheet one. But what we're going to do is remember that the sheets are objects and the sheet objects conceptually wrap all of the cells that are inside the sheet. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pull a cell out. And we'll pull it out using the uh, Python array referencing. And so this is the uh, cell. Interesting. Apparently it didn't quite clear out the module, so let me just launch it again from the beginning. Because this is uh, using the, the name of the cell by indexing, it's going to follow the familiar A1, B1, C1, A2, um, uh, Excel naming convention. So we'll just capture this into a variable called cell. And now if we start to take a look at cell, we can see, uh, for example, various bits of information on it. Like we can ask which row this cell is in, or which column <coughs> this cell is in. We can either do that by its proper lettered name or by its index. And one thing that's going to be a little uh, different for all of you who got very used to counting from zero <laughs> is that Unfortunately, due to the legacy and history of Excel spreadsheets, everything's going to count by one in this module. So for all of you who have gotten really used to writing your for loop starting from zero, in this case, just adjust accordingly. It is Excel. And so uh, there we, we found out the column, the column's index and the row. And of course, we can also pull out the value. And the value, you'll notice that this OpenPy Excel module is smart enough to read the metadata attributes about the cell columns. And so it has detected that the value inside here is actually a date value and has wrapped it 
with a Python uh, date time, a Python date time object. And so this is the Python date time object for this cell value. This is very useful because otherwise you wind up having to write a lot of boilerplate code that will check to see whether or not the type of that cell is a date type and then you would have to then parse that date into a date type. All of this is, is taken care of uh, uh, for you by this, uh, by this module. I assume it would work the same for uh, integers? Yes, it would work the same things? for integers. Um, I believe the, well here. You do the data? Over part? here, C1 is obviously an integer of 73, so we'll just say cell 3 equals, uh, and then we'll say sheet 1, get, or actually we'll do that by uh, the array reference, C1. And then if we do cell 3 value, you can see that it is the integer 73. Uh, likewise, if you were to say cell 2 was uh, B2, or B1, you can see that it is wrapped in a Python string. So over here, what they're doing is they're just going to uh, go ahead and build up a string. Now they're using the REPL, uh, you know, stringification output. And so what they're going to do is they pulled out the uh, C, which was, uh, in this case, B1, its row, which is the first row, and then its column, and then its value. And so it'll say row 1, column B is apples. And I'll save you the typing unless you truly believe that this isn't going to happen. Um, and then likewise, what you can do is you can simply uh, refer to the coordinate, which would be the full uh, name of the cell, if you wanted to uh, pull that out. And so this basically says cell B1 is apples. And uh, likewise, you don't need to store the cell into a variable. If you feel comfortable just pulling it out directly from its name, and you can just uh, pull uh, the, the get operation on the sheet and immediately get the value of 73. So does anybody have any um, difficulty understanding how the open PyXL module will work? Because everything else builds on top of this ability to reference cells. Who thinks that they can't do this right now? All right, I got one taker. All right, do you, do you have a specific problem or are you just? Um, I do not have a specific question. Okay. Just that I'm still trying to catch up on like open uh, loading the work. Okay, so if you're having difficulties um, importing open Pi Excel, you may need to use PIP3 in order to install it into your Python 3 environment. Yeah, I thought it had something to do with it, but then I went to the Python and um, just import manually. So that's pretty wild. I'm not going to install. And, and that will. You may have to do it as root user if you are on a, a Linux box. It is possible to do pip3 installs as just your user. Um, if you're on a Fedora box or some sort of Red Hat derivative, it's DNF install Python 3 open pi. Excel. Or Yum. And if you're on a Debian based system, I'm I'm sure you're one Google away from finding the correct install. Okay. So uh, there's more than one way to reference things uh, because basically having to know those exact letter number coordinate systems. It's not particularly flexible. 
And so what you can do is you can basically take the sheet and use the typed param uh, the um, the named parameters in Python in order to pass in the exact row and column that you want. And this is a lot easier when you're trying to do things using loops. Because the loops, you know, typically you would use numeric values across your loops. And uh, this would allow you to pull out things either in particular rows or columns. And so what you can do is you can say, um, let's do sheet one. Oops. Cell, we can say row is one and the column is two. And that will give us sheet. This is the uh, sheet based cell naming reference that uh, you'll sometimes see in Excel. And this is the cell in sheet one at B1. And uh, once again, you're actually getting back a cell object. So if you were to say dereference that with value, then you would actually get the value. And uh, this allows us to do various things. Uh, for example, uh, who remembers the range operator? It's been a while. Okay. So it basically pumps out a list of numbers. And so here, um, they're emphasizing skipping every other row. Uh, but generally speaking, you could say something like for i in range 1 to 8. And then you could basically print the row for i. Okay, And so if I wanted to dump the uh, entire uh, second column, then I could do for i in range 1 to 8, and then I could do print sheet 1 cell row equals i, column equals 2, value. The parentheses after the print statement? Oh, shoot, yeah, sorry. Probably mess up my rep I Don't think it'll pick up right there. Yeah, it's unexpected. Okay, so let's start off all over again. And there we go. And then, of course, I'm done. And it dumps the entire second row. And just for visual reference, that would be this B column. I'm the second column. That would be this B column. And uh, there are ways that you can get the maximum elements on a sheet. Now, um, all of these things can be done inside of Excel, but the point is, is that if you're doing it inside of Excel, you almost always have to have a human doing it at some point in time. So writing this software allows you to automate uh, the processing of these spreadsheets. So uh, if you were to, say, perform an operation on column B, Excel has sort of a last field uh, cell operation, which will give you the upper limit of the filled out cells. That way you don't wind up processing cells 8 onto whatever the maximum cell is that can be supported. And uh, if you do that, then you can basically get the max row or the max column for your sheet. So if we go back to sheet one and say, uh, let's see, they keep going down so it'd be max row, you can see that we have seven rows. And so you could say something like for i in range one, sheet one, max row plus one, because remember that range always drops the last element.
and there we've done exactly the same thing, except this time we've made this snippet of Python responsive to the number of elements that are actually inside the sheet. So if someone adds in some more rows, then this will still transverse the entire uh, column. Likewise, there's a max column in case you're transversing right to left. And one of the advantages of uh, doing this in software is that you can control it. Sometimes it's more important to uh, transverse rows first. Other times it's more important to transverse columns. Sometimes you have uh, information that's laid out by column and you want it to be laid out by row. Uh, it's always possible to create a new sheet, read one sheet one particular way, and write the, the other sheet in the other operation. So, one of the um, sticky points with Python is this lettering and numbering. And it's very useful to be able to convert between the two. Um, I might not know off the top of my head, uh, head what the column AT is in numeric indexing. Likewise, I might not want to do the math to figure out what the 67th column is. So uh, you don't need to have a spreadsheet open because that translation is going to be there. Uh, it's going to be the same with or without a spreadsheet. Uh, but Pi Excel has uh, some extra uh, functions, and they're inside OpenPy Excel's cell uh, module. And so you can actually get the column letter or get the column index from string. And uh, if you remember, uh, the, the from uh, basically means of populating your namespace, then this will make sure that every time you use get column letter, it is bound to the OpenPy Excel cells get column letter. Okay? And uh, that just saves you from, say, having to type in OpenPy Excel cell get column letter. And so if we were to uh, go ahead and. I think you have to add an extra dot cell after the open pixel dot cell. Or lowercase. Yeah. Wonders of going from Python 2 to Python 3. <laughs> so, okay, now if we do get column letter for one, we would expect this to be A, and if we do uh, get column letter for 27, we'd expect that to be AA because we finally walked past Z. And if we did it for that number, we apparently get REN. And likewise, if we do the uh, column index from string, we can do REN, and it will give us back the same index we passed, because it's a one-to-one -one mapping. It's not going to change over time. So uh, this is incredibly useful if you have um, some sort of need to, say, read a cell, and the cell may have a formula in it, and the formula actually refers to another column by, you know, its, its letter and you really need to have it by its index. Or, likewise, if you need to do the conversion in the opposite way. And um, so, right now we're starting to get to the point to where we're, we've done all the little basic lookups. So the only thing that's left now is to do uh, ranged lookups. And you've done this in Excel, no doubt, when you have the sheets open and you drag your cursor over some number of cells and you highlight a block. Okay? And this highlighting a block is a common operation in Excel that permits you to build tables and all sorts of things. And so what they will use is they will use basically still the array access, but they will use a range operator. And it will transverse, uh, basically it will transverse by column, the first row, and then the second row, and then the third row. 
okay? And uh, this way you can basically walk the table. So if you take a look at this um, row of cell objects, snippet right here, all that's happening is we are walking the first three rows and the first three columns, and then for every one of those objects, we're going to print the coordinate or the cell name of that object, and then we're going to print its value. And then because we've basically, this will uh, walk the, uh, the rows, and then this will walk the columns, then we're going to print before we leave the rocking, walking of rows end of row, so we can separate out each row. It's a nested loop, and I know that some of you are very comfortable with nested loops, and other people have just started programming Python a few weeks ago. So I'd like to um, ask, is there anybody who's not clear on this, this idea that right here, we're pulling out basically uh, tuples, and if you look very carefully, you can see that there's two parentheses here, all right? The first parenthesis is the entire set of all of the cells that we're pulling out, but the second parenthesis is the cells ordered by its row. So here, you take a look, and this is A1, B1, C1, and it's this nested tuple that allows you to separate this row from the next row, where it's A2, B2, C2, okay? So you'll get, in the outer collection, each row, and then inside there, you'll have a collection of each cell for that row. And this allows you to walk regions, much in the same way, if you'd selected them, you need to process them. To process them, you need to reference them. And this sheet, where you used ranged operators inside the uh, array capture, basically will print that out. Now this tuple right here is just for the formatting, okay? And so down here you can see that we're still using the same sheet uh, operation, but here we're capturing that into a row of cell objects and then for each row of cell objects we're processing that into a cell object. So this loop, this print statement will only be called for each inner cell, and then once it leaves there, you'll drop down to print end of row, and then you will continue the loop on the next row of cell objects. So uh, hopefully without belaboring the point, um, I, it is important to understand the flow of control of this. Does anybody have a hard time following the uh, processing flow there. No? All right, well then we'll just move on. So uh, over here, basically it's the same thing. We're getting the active sheet off the workbook, okay? And then we're going to basically capture the columns. Now, keep in mind that by capturing the columns, we're capturing the columns for uh, column, sorry, I'm dry. So here what we're doing is we're capturing the columns uh, for, uh, we're referencing all of the rows in the columns. So the columns is what we're dereferencing and we're getting basically uh, the first column and so we will get all of the cells in that column down. Likewise, they've got a rows that will get all of the cells across a row. So if you were to uh, pull out rows,
So apparently the uh, library has moved on and we're now talking about something that's deprecated inside this book. But the point is, is that um, what you can do is, let's see if that'll work within the um, generator context. So in order to do this, I'd imagine that, let's see if we can just find the uh, actual function. talked about uh, basically just using this function, they're going to force you to correctly uh, construct a tuple off of it. And so you can't use columns or rows as uh, illustrated inside the book, but what you need to do is you basically need to um, reference the object and then collapse that into a tuple. So you would just put tuple around sheet columns so it could be dereferenced with the uh, array operator. I know that it was kind of weird to stumble across it, but um, does anybody, is anybody thrown by that? Nope? Okay. So, uh, how, real short recap. Uh, generally speaking, when you are working with Python uh, and using the OpenPyXL, you're going to load your workbook, which will give you back a workbook object. You're going to find your sheet, either by looking for the active sheet or a sheet by name. Once you get that, you're going to uh, store that, and that'll be the variable that is holding your worksheet object. And then you'll basically use uh, the cell operations, or the row and column operations, in order to walk the uh, cells inside the sheet. And um, once you've got an actual cell in one of your inner loops somewhere, then you can call various methods or read some of the attributes on it, such as its value, uh, its name, its location, its row, and its column. So uh, they have a little project here, which is reading data from a spreadsheet. And this is census information. Uh, I don't know if this is real census information or not, but the point is, is that it's a very large spreadsheet filled with population information, and they're going to give you um, basically a little programming assignment. They want you to open up the spreadsheet and uh, read through the spreadsheet, but they want you to collapse the information inside the spreadsheet. And so the idea is that for each county, they would like to have a population. And uh, currently, this spreadsheet is organized by census tract, which is basically the path that the census takers walk. And so for each county to have its own population, you would have to add up all of the tracts for that county. Now, this would be very time consuming to do by hand, because not only would you have to collapse uh, each county, but you would also have to verify that the state was the same for that county, just in case there happens to be two Fresno counties in different states or something like that. So uh, the point is, is that uh, he walks through a sort of pseudo rationale of his overall flow. He says, you read the data from the spreadsheet, you count the number of census tracts for each county, because this is one of the things that they want to have uh, in the output. You count the total population for each county, and you want to print the results. Now, 
He puts a lot of effort into talking about this processing. But you've got to understand that um, the overall flow is the part that's important. Open the spreadsheet, keep two accumulators, one for each county and one for each, uh, um, uh, one to count the census tracts in the county and one to count the population in the county. Now, because there's no guarantee that the spreadsheet is in order, it's not enough to do this in a for loop. Because if you do this in a for loop, and some census you know, coordinator basically puts down a census tract for a different county in the middle of a run of, say, this, um, this San Francisco county. Let's say that there just happens to be a census tract number that got used somewhere else, and then they realized they had a couple more census tracts in uh, San Francisco. An accumulator won't work. You can't just add these numbers up because what will happen is, is you'll come down and you'll see that a different county is there. And so you'll reset your accumulator back to zero. You'll write your result out and then you will find another San Francisco later on. And so what you need to do is you need to store these results as an intermediate storage. And by storing them as an intermediate storage, He's going to use a data structure that I don't really think is the most elegant in the world, but it works. And sometimes working is just enough. And what he's going to do is he's going to create di nested dictionaries. And so his first nested dictionary, his utmost nested dictionary is going to be a state dictionary, where you'll have all of the state keys, and that will reference another dictionary that will then have all of the county keys which will then reference the actual dictionary of the number of census tracts yes this is why I kind of tried to warn you. I know all of our, our very heavily data science people are really dying inside right now. So dead. Okay. And so we'll have like 37 here, and then we'll have like a population key, which will be like, you know, it's Brazoria County, probably like 2.1 billion. Okay. And that's how he has decided that he's going to structure this data structure. So here we see him opening the census pop data. Okay, if you want this file and you want to, um, you know, try it out, I've, uh, if you have not downloaded the code samples, the code samples also come with the actual raw data. <coughs> and he's going to fetch out the sheet population by census tract. And here you can see that he has initialized his county data dictionary. And then he's going to fill the county data with each county's population and tract. So he's reading the row. And here we go. We're going to the max row, plus one, because it is one indexing in this. And he's using range, which always drops the last value. And for each row in the spreadsheet, notice he skipped over the title. Okay, He is going to pull out the state, county, and the population. Now, he is using string concatenation here in order to build up the actual sheet name. But he could also do the sheet cell and use the row and column and just do it, say, by numerical indexing, which would make me feel a little bit better. But uh, apparently, that's not going to happen. So now it's time for him to populate the data structure. And so here is his idea of how he's going to lay out this data structure as nested dictionaries of nested dictionaries of dictionaries. And uh, here he's that way he can easily pull out county data by basically using the, um, the array operator multiple times. And so in order to do that, here we have the state, county, and population that we pulled out of the spreadsheet. 
and he is going to call a set default, okay, where he basically says, hey, if there is a value for this state, remember what does set default do if there's a value? Use the value if it says value. Yeah, it just uses the value. And if it doesn't have a value, what does it do with this uh, dictionary? It creates an empty entry into it. Yep, it creates the empty dictionary of that value and will return that back. And then he's going to basically say, okay, now that I know that there's either an empty dictionary or an existing dictionary in here, I can dereference it and I will set default for the county. And of course, if it's not there, he's just initializing the tracts and population to be zero. And if it is there, then basically it's going to be a no one. Now that he knows that both the state, county, and tracts exist, since we're only counting one tract per row, he'll simply increment that value by one. And now that he knows that the state, county, and population exists, he's going to be incrementing the uh, population by the actual population value. And he's not trusting that to come across as a numeric, because sometimes people do store text numbers inside Excel spreadsheets. So he's going to wrap that in an int, which means that if it happens to be a text number, it'll still be a numeric number and it'll still add it. Now, notice right here that it's state, county, and quote tracks. This is a side effect of the way that he chose his data structure. Whereas the state and county are variables, the tracks is a constant string. So he knows he's always adding to the tracks when he's running this line, and he always knows that he's adding to the population. So now that he has that inside the for loop, it's going to run through every row and it will build up that data structure. Now, if you thought that the choice of data structures could be slightly distasteful, his choice of storage output is quite interesting too. He's going to use uh, Python pickling and basically write the data structure out as a Python file, as an actual Python code file. I, I see the <laughs> somersaulting right there on the, the second row, just out of camera range. So angry. <laughs> so angry. I and know. so when your shop decides to upgrade to a different language, all that data is completely lost. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> just import it and then you just write it from one language to another using more Python, right? <laughs> uses for just. I don't know if <laughs> I know. There's not very much justice in this just. Okay, so here he opens up a Python <laughs> file and he uses the PyPrint P format in order to effectively just pickle that data straight into a string and writes it into all data. And so that way I'll just sort of skip down because, uh, does he have an example of the output? No, he doesn't have an example of the output. So, okay, our eyes are spared. But uh, you'd basically see all data equals open curly brace. And then a large dictionary of state, to dictionary of counties, and then dictionary of counties to dictionary of the population and a uh, uh, number of tracks. Wait, is that actually a data structure people use in real life? You can use it in real life. <laughs> Much in the same way you can use a butter knife in order to unscrew something in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Many a time, I do this is really often. <laughs> Wait, is the butter knife not the best tool for the job? <laughs> well, it's the only one you a highly have controversial to subject, and I'm not going to. It's the only one in your hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, and we have another question on the back row. So I was commenting about the butter knife. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, I am not going to throw any stones at butter, butter knife using glass houses because I've used plenty of butter knives for things they shouldn't have been used for. 
and occasionally some of those butter knives turn out very bent inside the butter knife. So, there you go. So, um, he's got some ideas for similar programs, uh, you know, comparing data across multiple rows and spreadsheets. Um, you know, maybe I come from a spreadsheet poor background. There's not too many times where I see the same data blindly, blindly copied into other spreadsheets. But there are many times when I do see the need to, say, collate many spreadsheets into one. And so like opening up three or four different spreadsheets, cleaning them up to have one format and writing them all a big spreadsheet. That might be very useful. And uh, likewise, um, comparing uh, between spreadsheets. I've never worked in a place that used spreadsheets where they were consistent enough to be compared. Um, but that said, if you were building a workflow processing pipeline that used Excel spreadsheets as your data delivery payload, <laughs> you could do this, or you could just use all that newfound Python to actually write a processing pipeline that used the data in its original format before you started emailing it as a transport pattern to other people. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this one is terribly useful. You can check the values for known bogus values. For example, if you have a spreadsheet that has lots of information, a spreadsheet that perhaps contains the number of billable hours of your employees, yes, some payroll processing systems start there, then you could check to see if someone didn't have their hours filled out which might be useful before you actually decide that you want to cut the checks. And uh, likewise, you can always just read the data from the spreadsheet, use it in a programming language where you have a lot more flexibility. Um, but in the event you want to actually write it back out instead of, say, in a Python pickled object, into another Excel spreadsheet, which is marginally better, <laughs> then what you can do is you can always, uh, you know, create another spreadsheet. You could either create another spreadsheet by using the tried and true example of opening a spreadsheet, doing some processing, and then saving it back to a different spreadsheet name, which we saw me do when I saved it into a different name so I wouldn't destroy my only copy of the example spreadsheet. Um, but likewise, you can also do things like add sheets to your workbook and generate sheets from whole. Um, sometimes it's useful when you have a person who really, really wants that data from the database written into a spreadsheet for some various reasons. So you can basically, if you don't have tools to do that very easily using some other technique, you can basically write a quick Python module that will run your query against the database, gather the rows that you want, write them into the spreadsheet, and then uh, save it up. So here we are. Time to create a new sheet. So you'll notice that they open the workbook, or actually in this case they're creating a workbook from scratch. They're not reading it from a file. Okay, they get the sheet names. Well, every workbook in the OpenPy Excel module will have one sheet in it because it's invalid to have a workbook with no sheets. And that sheet will always be named sheet. Okay, but if you were to say create a sheet, then the sheet main conflict resolution will kick into effect and they will add a number to the end of the sheet. And so because you would, have named, you would have created a sheet named sheet, and you can't have two sheets with the same name, it'll be sheet one. If you call it again, it'll be sheet two, and sheet three, and sheet four. If you actually rename that sheet to something else and then say create sheet, then you will get sheet one. It's also possible to just sidestep this whole need to rename sheets by creating a sheet with the title already specified. I highly recommend that you do. And you can uh, also use the uh, named parameter index to indicate what ordering you want this sheet in. So this first sheet 
actually, because it's an index zero that you're creating, it comes before the other sheets. And whereas this index two, then remember we have zero, one, two, so it will come right before two and be inserted between sheet and sheet one. And doing this, you can lay out your uh, sheets inside newly generated workbooks as you wish. Uh, once again, getting the get sheet names returns back an uh, array of sheets. And uh, you can always use the get sheet by name in order to fetch out the specific sheet. Nothing new here, okay? Um, except that you've got to be very careful because there's a remove sheet operation that can actually blow away whole sheets. And by blowing away whole sheets, when you call get sheet name, you'll actually see the sheets are removed. Uh, because there is no need to remove a sheet name by its name index, whereas inserting, you might want it to insert into a specific spot. Removing it, there's no way you can remove a name sheet from a specific spot because the sheet is in whatever spot it's in. So there is no uh, index type parameter on this. But it is also possible to simply just remove the sheet by its index and not remove it by its name. You would use the uh, workbook sheet with the array, the reference, in order to fetch out whatever index sheet you've got. And then you would basically pull, uh, use, remove sheet, passing the sheet object. Because these are fetching the sheet objects. So you're removing and adding the sheet objects. Once you have a sheet object, then you can use the remove and it will just chop it out of the world. So writing value to cells, um, it's going to basically use the uh, reification where it instantiates that this A1 value has this hello world cell and you can call it afterwards uh, value. And that way, uh, even though it's not going to hold the memory for every one of the empty cells that you see on an Excel spreadsheet, because that's not how Excel does it internally either, um, but if you were to say set this, then as you set specific cell values, then those values will get written in the underlying XML data structure that is your workbook, and uh, so that way it's sort of, uh, it sort of grows at the rate of you actually using it. So what you can do is you can basically fetch out this sheet by name and then you set a cell in it and uh, then there you go, you've got the value set. Of course, you can also uh, get the cell using the get operation with the row and column if you wanted to do numeric indexing and then set that cell object at the same time. So here we have a spreadsheet. And this is another perfect use for Excel spreadsheet. Obviously, this man is running a grocery store in his Excel spreadsheet. And so he needs to update his prices. And so he is going to basically say, could open it up by hand and update the prices. The odds that I update the wrong price or the wrong cell is very high, especially if you have enough cells. And especially if, for some reason, you've decided to duplicate various items inside your spreadsheet. So here you'll notice that he has okra inside row three and inside row 11, okay? So why do anything by hand when you have Python? And so what he's going to do is he's going to basically use that same pattern of opening up the spreadsheet, looking over all the rows, looking to see if the row is a garlic, celery, or lemon row. And then if it is a garlic, celery, or a lemon row, he's going to change the price for that particular row. Now, I'm not really sure what the utility is of changing only three items and writing a whole program to do it. If I were writing a program to do it, as he will later on, I would basically get the item that I wanted to update and the price and then I'm going to update all of those and just run this program three times. But the point is, is that here he's got the prices that he wants to update, and so he's going to say if the produce name was celery, 
then update the price, garlic, or lemon. And because he's decided that this is going to be his controlled data structure ahead of time, the rest of the um, the rest of the OpenPy Excel module is all about loading the produce name from the row and loading the cell object for the price from the row. <coughs> And so we would expect to open up the uh, worksheet, uh, I'm sorry, the workbook, find the correct sheet that has their prices, and then to loop through each row, checking the produce name and possibly updating the cell that is adjacent to it with the price. So here are our price updates, conveniently captured into a uh, small dictionary. Here he's opening up produce cells and he's fetching the sheet by its name, which he apparently has not renamed this sheet, so it's just called sheet. And so what he does is he goes, he's skipping the titles, okay? He's going to max row. Now, uh, there is already a bug in this. Who can tell me what the bug is? Uh, zero plus one. You need the plus one because this will not correctly process the last row due to the fact that we're talking about one indexing in Excel spreadsheets. And then here he's going to reference the cell by row number, column number, and so the produce name is inside the first column, but we don't know which row it is it's because it's in the loop, so we'll use the row number. And then in if the produce name was inside the key set of price updates, then he is going to basically say the cell in column two, which happens to be his price cell, its value will be set to the price updates produce name. And so he's going to dereference whatever produce name it was inside his price updates, which will give the numeric value, and so once he's this snippet of code giving back the numeric value will then be used in this snippet of code which <coughs> references the price cell, and it'll update the price cell, and then later on he'll save it, and uh, because he always likes to save it into a new file in case he made a mistake, because for some reason he recommends that after you do all of this automated updating, you and compare your files to make sure that they work, which is good for students, but at some point in time, you'll probably want to uh, actually do some automated testing if you're doing this inside a professional environment. Um, but he's saving it into a updated produce cells, and if the updated produce cells looks good, he's assuming that the user will rename the file and, and copy it. And uh, there's a lot more verbiage to that, but that's basically what he's doing. It's a very simple process, and it's not so easy to do this kind of processing in real life, because if your spreadsheet has too many rows, then invariably you miss one. Okay, and one doesn't become updated. And likewise, it's not particularly easy to do this with anything other than a, a visual basic macro, because you're really updating a different row based off of the value in a previous row. And you're not doing it for all of the rows. So this means that most of the functions that are inside Excel don't really lend to this kind of update. And you could possibly do it if you created lots of extra database columns that basically captured your intermediate logic. Uh, not database columns, uh, Excel spreadsheet columns. But it's not worth it. Okay, so, um, and also that changes the spreadsheet. And if your spreadsheet is literally just to hold your data, then you don't want to like have if macros embedded into it. So, so I saw the pizza come in and uh, I'd like to take a break, uh, considering that we've gotten through his uh, second example. And uh, when we come back, we will basically uh, start talking about font style because the OpenPy XL allows you to access many more items than just the data. We're back. We're back.
talking about setting the font style of a cell. So you can, uh, through OpenPyXL, reference the styles uh, module and import the font object. And when you do this, this will allow you to create new fonts. Okay, so here it's a 24 point italic font. The other parameters aren't specified, so whatever kind of font finding rules your operating system will fall back to will be honored. And you just simply go back to that cell, and it has a font attribute, set it, and lo and behold, it will be 24 point italic. Uh, likewise, you can uh, pick quite a few uh, attributes inside this font object. If I show you a new font object, let's say we'll say F equals font, and then we'll do uh, size equals 24 points and uh, style, style, right? It's italic, it's true. And then we print this font object. You'll notice that there are many parameters. And we basically have full control over the styling. You can pick the name, the character set, the font family. B is for bold, I is italic, strikes through. Okay. Um, outline, shadow. Uh, condensed color, extended, basically anything you could want. Underline, vertical alignment, and uh, scheme. And if you spend enough time with Adobe Fonts, you probably know exactly what every one of those items does. But the point is, is that you'll probably only deal with a few of them inside your typical programming. Name, if you need to pick a particular font name. Size, with point size, bold, and italic. And so here we have a person deciding that they are going to uh, build the Times New Roman font with bold flags set on. They set that to the font and then because, you know, no sense in making it name something different so it would be like slightly less confusing, they will then set the value to bold Times New Roman. And uh, likewise, they pick an italic font and they said this is just a 24 point italic. And there's our bold times new Roman and our 24 point italic. Formulas. Formulas inside an Excel spreadsheet are just strings. Okay? Uh, but they are strings that start with the equals character. Likewise, if you wish to set a formula, you need to know the Excel text of the formula. And you simply call the function with the range. Now this will be Excel text, so that means it'll have to be the letter number format. This indicates from B1 to B8. And the equal sign at the beginning, Excel will key on that and realize that you're asking for a computation as opposed to asking for the string sum to be displayed. And so here, uh, you can imagine that you could easily write a small Python script that would detect the end of your column and slip in a sum from the beginning to the end and sum it up. And so here is somebody building a workbook and using Python's sum, uh, not Python, uh, Excel sum. And then that way, when it writes it out, they will get A1 is 200, A2 is 300, and A3 will appear to be 500. But if you focus in on the cell and take a look at what's in there, it will actually say sum of A1. And if you really get into Excel programming, then you can write 
wonderful little routines that you can paste into cells that look something like this. And uh, this is probably a good reason why you should do more of your programming in the Python layer and less of it in the Excel layer. Because while this might be reactive if someone updates the uh, spreadsheet without Python, debugging these kinds of uh, commands is very difficult, which is the reason why there was the 2.8 errors per spreadsheet quote that was uh, given out earlier. So adjusting rows and columns. There's several things that you can do to rows and columns. Uh, one of the things that you can do to rows and columns is I can grab this row and sort of like make it bigger. All right, and likewise I can grab this column and sort of drag it and make it bigger or make it smaller. Believe it or not, uh, there is a very, very, very popular question that's almost always asked, which is, how can I shrink the column to just the size of the data that's within it? Well, in this case, you can definitely specify the height and the width of the column, all right? And uh, using a little bit of math and your font object, you can actually calculate the height and the width of the items that are inside the column and then figure out which one is the maximum and set them all the same. Uh, you can definitely do that without using Python, but uh, by and far it is something that is surprisingly more difficult than it should be, and I would highly recommend that you use Python to do so. Give me a second because we may interrupt our filming. I, I plug my laptop in so it doesn't turn off. Fantastic. Now notice that in order to specify that we are actually trying to update the dimensions of the column or some sort of attribute that's across the column as a whole, we're not using the columns operation and gathering the index out of it. Instead, we're using the column dimensions. And that will return back the dimension object, which has height and width operators. Likewise, there, uh, and so here we've created a very tall row and a very wide column by basically uh, setting the dimensions on that. Um, the units in which the dimensions are handled in the um, OpenPy Excel module is points. And points is an old typographic uh, unit that is effectively 172. I can't say it right, so I'm going to write it up. <coughs> One seventy second of an inch. And uh, unfortunately, points are still big in font, mostly due to the history of font and typography. Uh, but that said, if you need to really figure out exactly how much you need to do it, then you have Python there in order to be able to calculate it in inches and then divide it by uh, 70 seconds of an inch. And then you can set it exactly how much you want. So um, one thing that you may have done uh, in Excel uh, at some point in time is you get a couple of cells 
and then you go over and you want to basically merge the cells. And uh, let's see, where's the operator <coughs> here? There. And so by merging the cells, effectively what you have done is you've taken the contents of this D1 cell and you've indicated that it will display overlapping the other cells that you've selected, whether that's just the E1, but in this case it's actually the D2 and the E2 cells. And so this one cell will have a very large presentation. If we uh, type some information in and we indicate that it's to be centered, it will center over all of the merged cells. Okay? Uh, you have the operate, uh, ability to merge and unmerge cells uh, through the OpenPyXL module. Uh, you do have to specify the range of cells that you wish to merge it across. This will be, again, be the same as our rectangle selection pattern where you specify the upper left cell and the lower right cell. And so this would merge it four uh, columns across and three cells down. And then by setting the upper left uh, item, this 12 cells merged together will be displayed across all of those cells. Likewise, this will just merge two neighboring C and D cells, and this will just be the two merged cells. Um, they have a nice little output of this, so I'm not going to bother showing it to you inside the console. Uh, likewise, if you have merged cells, you may find it necessary to unmerge them. Again, you can specify a range and it will uh, break those cells back down into where they won't display with the uh, merge attribute. And then this way you'll get all of your uh, individual cells back. Uh, who has ever used freeze paint? <clears throat> okay. So freeze paint is basically it's a way you can specify particular rows or columns. And if you go over to freeze them, then what happens is, is as you scroll, your frozen rows or frozen columns will not move whereas the other elements of data will. So you may want to say um, freeze uh, title. You know, if you've got uh, labels at the top, and then that way let your spreadsheet scroll the data up as you scroll through each row, and you can still see the labels of what each column is. So you have access to freeze panes Okay, and what you'll do is you'll basically uh, capture this. This operates on the sheet level. So you can specify which freeze panes are going to uh, be set. And then when they are set, then when you start doing your scrolling, then what will happen is the frozen panes will not move. Yes? Oh, you just looked like you were ready to say something. So. Okay, so... Um, in this case, uh, he's effectively frozen his title, and you can see that even though this is row 1, right beneath it is row 1591, because he has scrolled up 1590-some-odd rows underneath this frozen pane. And probably the most important part is charting, because a lot of times you need to visualize your data. It may not be the most sophisticated way of visualizing it, but one of the uh, reasons that, that Excel has managed to get such penetration is not just its ability to, go, to do computation in a way that's easy for most people to uh, understand without a lot of programming background, but also because you can easily display the information in charts. And so you, in order to use the charting operations through OpenPyXL. You need to create a reference object, which is going to be your rectangular selection. Uh, you might recognize that as like your data selection. Okay, A series object, which will basically 
create your decisions on like which are rows and which are columns and things like that. And then a chart object. And you take this series object, which is sort of your cleaned up understanding of the uh, selection area, and pass that to the chart object. And uh, it gets a little complicated, but it's not too bad, really. So over here, uh, there, he's just walking through and talking about some uh, coordinate arguments. But the idea is you've got your worksheet that contains your chart data, OK? You've got a, he's saying that um, you're going to be creating your reference using that worksheet and also a tuple of two integers representing the top left cell, okay? And then um, the, the second one, of course, the first one will be the row and the second one will be the column. And then the tuple of two integers representing the bottom right cell. Now we've been talking about these rectangular regions and referencing them through the name conventions of like A1 to B3 or something like that. So this is not too new, okay? And so right here, he's got um, basically a couple examples. This is the selection from 1, 1 to 10, 1. Whereas this is the selection from uh, 3, 2 to 6, 4. And there's the selection of just one cell, 5, 3 to 5, 3. So here is uh, the example to create a bar chart. And so what he's done here is he's basically uh, started populating some data into his spreadsheet. And then what he's going to do is he's going to uh, notice the sheet is stored in a variable called sheet. And so he's going to create a reference. Okay, and the reference is the selection. So it's a sheet starting from 1, 1 to 1, 10. Now they're just using named parameters here. So you can uh, keep track of the min column, min max column, min and max row. And now that he has this reference, he's going to basically create a series off that reference and give it a title. And you'll remember that there are some things that need to be added to the cells inside creating an Excel chart. And uh, that's where this series really comes in useful. It allows you to like label the, the various uh, rows and columns. So now that this series has a title, he'll create a bar chart. He'll give the chart itself a title. And then he will add the data series to the chart. Okay? And then he will add the chart to a cell. And then he will save the workbook. So this cell is. Um, C5, and so you can see that the uh, chart is added in. Now, I'm assuming that he's just trying to illustrate the defaults because there is no place where we have specified the pixel offsets for this chart. But the point is, is that you have both bar charts, line charts, scatter charts, and pie charts available and you can actually open up a, uh, a sheet inside a workbook and save a chart. And um, that pretty much covers the entirety of what you can do with Excel spreadsheets. And so he's going to basically give you a couple of simple programming problems a multiplication table matrix. You might want to uh, you know, write a couple of loops and then populate a spreadsheet for uh, blank row inserter, uh, which will basically uh, insert some blank rows wherever you specify that you need them. And a uh, spreadsheet inverter. And this one actually is most likely to be the most valuable one that he's, he's actually demonstrated. Where you'll read down a spreadsheet and rewrite it. You know, if you need a, a different format. So um, there's not much more to say about Excel spreadsheets, except that if you find yourself really working in an environment where you have to write a lot of automated processing of spreadsheets, um, generally speaking, that's a good indication that perhaps you shouldn't be using spreadsheets as heavily as you're using them. 
Uh, they are very prone to error. They're very prone to update issues. Uh, if I send a spreadsheet to somebody, they can open it up, accidentally clip a number, change a number, send it back to me. Um, it's really hard to keep spreadsheets revisioned, tracked. And so, uh, generally speaking, after a while, you'll probably use this OpenPy uh, Excel module primarily to read information from spreadsheets and populate databases in ways that make it a lot easier to maintain the data and maintain the data safety. So that's it for uh, spreadsheets. And uh, we'll wrap up and save the rest of the evening. Cool. Any questions? Why would we do that? What? Why would we use Python instead of teaching base? Because most of the time, using Python to interface to Excel is far easier on a person who knows Python than using Excel to interface <laughs> with Excel. And that's the primary reason why. Because uh, as the Excel spreadsheets grow from something that you can't put all on one screen, then you run into real issues of like, is there a row that's missing a value? Well, you know, if it's a thousand rows long, you could probably even tolerate scrolling down it. If it's a hundred thousand rows long, probably even if you're scrolling down it at a high rate of speed, wasting ten minutes of your life that you'll never get back, and probably still missing the row that was missing. So sometimes it's better to write programs simply because the program is so good at doing these mundane tasks that uh, you just use it to do the mundane task a lot faster. Could there be any performance benefits? Like, I guess, could Python handle a larger spreadsheet or a larger set of data and do more operations more quickly? I promise you Python can handle a larger set of data than I can by hand. Yeah and will definitely do it more quickly than I will by hand. It's not a by hand thing. Like I've got a friend who has economic models in Excel and he runs them through there. Sometimes they take 20, 30 minutes to run. And he's wondering if this can speed things up. So if you're doing that, then um, remember how I said that the programming inside the spreadsheet is very error prone? Yeah. Okay. You probably would be better off using the spreadsheet as an input source and then performing the operations in Python and writing the output. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Um, but uh, I was under the impression that, like, me trying to hand verify that all these numbers are under 100, you know, if these numbers were percentages, if I had a Python module that basically said every value in this column is under 100, and I would basically say, you know, verify percentage on this spreadsheet, you know, column C. And it just immediately spat back, ah, oh, no, row five. That would be a lot easier um, if I didn't have seven entries. Okay, if I had 7,000 entries, it would practically be required. Because the other operation is me loading it up, waiting for it all to load up, going over here, making sure that I sort this column, reading the top entries to make sure that they're under 100, and then praying that I didn't actually check or uncheck the decoupling the columns when I sorted an option, which would be really important. <laughs> But um, there are some things that you can do with uh, uh, spreadsheets that are just amazingly, amazingly geeky cool because you really shouldn't do them with spreadsheets. Like, like drawing <laughs> but, those pictures? Huh? Like drawing those complicated pictures? I have seen a spreadsheet that was set up with such regularity that they had large sections of these columns set up to be perfect squares. And you would type in information on one page of the sheet, and it would generate Gantt charts on the other sheet, 
sheet by coloring the squares. <laughs> like I said, it's a certain kind of beauty, not necessarily the kind of beauty you want to maintain. But a disturbing you... kind of beauty. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's not the beauty you want to maintain, but it's, it's sort of this thing where you're like, Wow! You admire the he built a three-story house out of used toilet tissue. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you really got to admire the things. <laughs> I didn't even know it could support an upper floor. You know, it's just <laughs> so. This is this is, uh, and, and sometimes Excel is a decent tool for the job, but for the most part. Uh, Excel usually gets in there first because people have the office suites. They don't have much programming background. They don't have much programming knowledge. Some guy reads some book on Excel macros, and next thing you know, they start building business solutions on it. And so you punch in your numbers here, and then it calculates your taxes there and something else. And, and a lot of programs start this way. And if there's enough demand for them, then they grow into mature programs by getting rewritten. Okay? Um, and if there's not enough demand for them, there is a, a place in the world for quick and dirty because no one's ever going to want more than two copies of this. But uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting place. And if you get into a shop where large amounts of their business processing is controlled through Excel. Um, it's also very difficult culturally to talk them out of that. And so at least you can tolerate it by writing your stuff in Python where you feel like you've got a little bit better control of the information. Plus, if you need to say merge your Excel stuff with something else, it's not that easy to merge Excel row entry with anything except Microsoft Word. And if you thought that Excel did not make a good programming environment, Microsoft Word makes an even worse one. <laughs> but you can use Microsoft Smell Merge in order to get Excel rows copied into Word template fields. And surprisingly, a lot of people who've been using Word their entire lives never know this. And so when it's time to do a mass mailing, they don't have personalized mass mailings. Hmm. Or you can use a Python module and just simply read down the spreadsheet and send the uh, email and code. Either way. If you do the Python module, when it's time to change it over to read that information out of the database, you'll have less stuff to change. So that's it. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? Besides, why in the world would you actually use Python <laughs> to read Excel? Um, Since I think there's a modicum of business value there. <laughs> <laughs>